Well, I'm very happy to be here today. I guess I do need to put this mic on. It's been mentioned that I am from Decatur, Arkansas. And how many of you know where Decatur, Arkansas is? And some of you have been to our center. And I remember when you drove down and came to check us out a little bit. I'm going to this morning, you know, it's a breath of fresh air to come into a traditional Seventh-day Adventist church. I go to one, but uh, I don't find this very often. And uh, so I never know how much time do I have uh, to speak here. Last week, I spoke in the Eden Valley Church in Colorado. Anybody know where Eden Valley is out there, close to Loveland? And I think it was a quarter tail when I stepped to the pulpit. <laughs> and of course, they, they allowed me to go a little extra. But uh, I have a lot to share. And I would uh, I'd love to share it all. But I can't, even, I can't even cover half of it today. But I'm going to share with you, and I'm going to back up here, if you don't mind. I am going to back up my slides because I, I cut something out of my slides that I don't want to. It, it will be very helpful if I include this in today's talk. And so I'm going to put it in here. I'll, I'll see where we go. I grew up in a very solid Seventh-day Adventist home. I would choose my parents. If I were a young person and had the, had the choice to choose your parents, I would choose mine. I grew up in the western part of Oklahoma, way out there where from our farm, you could look in every direction and see no sign that there's any more on planet Earth. Very interesting place to grow up. Little town called Shattuck, if any of you are familiar with that part of the country. Shattuck. Okay. <laughs> Do you know, well, I'll, I'll say this since you uh, commented on it, at one time, the Shattuck, Seventh-day Adventist Church, and it's a town of less than a thousand people, had 600 Seventh-day Adventist members. It was the largest Adventist church west of the Mississippi in 1910. A very uh, interesting situation. It was a collection of Germans from Russia. And even in the days that I was there, uh, we had both English and German hymn books in the, in the hymn rack. Anyway, we were on a farm. And I had watched my father uh, through the years uh, do things with God. We used to have in Adventism something that really should be brought back. How many of you remember the investment program? Investment. Got quite a few hands. Investment was something in which hopefully all of the members would get involved with and uh, they would pick a project and it could be anything. And you would ask for God to bless that project. And I remember so many of these projects having amazing results because of God's blessing. And the funds that were collected from the investment program went to start new work somewhere around the world. So it was a wonderful program. I do not know why it quit, probably because the people weren't participating like they should. Anyway, one day, my father came in and he said to the family, I've picked what I want to do for investment this year. 
And uh, he, picked a, uh, he picked one of the cows in his herd. He named it, and I gave that name last week, and I found out there were three women in the church that had that name. <laughs> and they weren't too pleased <laughs> to have this cow and them to have the same name. Anyway, he named uh, which cow it was going to be because we had all of our cows named. And he said, her calf is going to be God's calf this year. And so, oh, that's wonderful. That's a good investment project. And we'll see what happens. And so as we're going along and it's calving season and finally it's time for this cow to have her calf. And... Uh, she had her calf, but wait a minute. <laughs> For the first time in our cattle raising experience, we had twins. And uh, really and truly, it was the only time. This is not a real normal thing for cattle. Maybe it is more today with the hormones, I don't know. But in our day, it was a rarity to have twins from a cow. And so again, here my mind is stimulated as I'm watching in our home circle how God has blessed my father. Now, I'd, li I'd love to tell you many more stories, but I don't have the time this morning. But I want to share with you that as I grew up, and I did go to Ozark Academy down here, and I know some of you did, and I graduated there. Uh, and uh, when I graduated, I, I was, as most uh, young men my age, thinking, what could I do to earn a little money? And here we are on this farm, and I noticed Dad had about five acres of one spot that uh, uh, nothing was done with. It had some trees on it, never been fenced. And so I came to Dad, and I said, Dad, could I use that five acres there? If I'd build a fence around it, could I use it? I'd like to buy a couple of cows and raise baby calves. He said, sure. And so uh, I did the fencing, and I bought a couple of cows, and I was doing carpenter work as, uh, as my way of earning some money. And as I would uh, get a little ahead with some money, I would go to the sale barns. And in the sale barn, in the back, I would look and they have a calf pen because we have a lot of dairies in this part of the country and there are dairy orphans in abundance. And so I would go back to the calf pen and I'd look at the calves and I'd look to see how healthy they were and I'd pick out a good one and I'd I'd, when it'd go through the ring, I'd purchase it. And so my calves were doing quite well. And then uh, one day I drove to uh, two towns up from Siloam Springs, which was our hometown. And uh, the town was Gravit. I guess it's three towns up. And they had a little sail barn. And I went back to the calf pens and... Uh, I saw this little guy. Now, you know what kind of breed this is. These are Jerseys. This was a Jersey bull calf. Are Jersey bull calves worth a whole lot? Not too much. <laughs> and uh, I, didn't, I wasn't really interested in it until I got into the, I, th I went to the auction anyway, and I was sitting in the ring, sitting in the uh, stands there, and the little calf came through, and he was pretty scrawny, too, I'll tell you that. And uh, uh, I thought, no, surely, yeah, I'll buy it for $5. That's what I paid for him. And I put him in the back of my pickup, and I'm headed home. And as I'm headed home, I am uh, thinking in my mind, you know, Dad always had projects with God. And in a way, I'm kind of selfish because I'm not sure this guy's going to survive. <laughs> and so I'm thinking, uh, Lord, I never said anything now. I want you to know that. I said, Lord, in my mind, uh, I'm going to give the profits of this calf to you. 
This will be my first experience to do something with you. And so, but that was it. It was all in my mind. And I headed home with the little guy and uh, giving him the cow's milk and so forth. He started to do very well. In fact, he started to look like that. And uh, one day, as I was down there feeding and so forth, a thought came in my mind. Now, you saw that my first slide on the screen was a maze. All of us. Life is a maze for us. We all have a different maze. Is that not correct? Every one of us are traveling on a different road, totally, totally different from anyone else in the world. And it, it makes a lot of difference as we go through this maze. How many of you have actually gone through like a corn maze? Anybody here? Now, you know, you can look at a maze from the top and you can kind of see which way you ought to go. But if you're in an actual like corn maze <laughs> and you come to a crossroad, which way shall I go, <laughs> left or right? Does it make a difference? It makes a big difference. Well, anyway, I'm telling you a little of the last 15 years of my maze, okay? That's what I'm sharing with you here today. So I made the decision I'm going to give this calf to the Lord, the prophets of it. And he's looking good. And then as I looked at him that day, I thought, wow, you know what? I never told anybody that I was going to give the profits to God. I'm going to give half of the profits to God. So I had come to another crossroad in my maze. And I made a second decision. What do you think of that decision? You know, I, I thought, well, it's still going to be a good gift. I never told God. I never kneeled down. I never prayed it. It was all in my mind. So I went back to the house. I um, slept that night, got up the next morning, milked the cows, went over to feed my calves. And I don't know if you've guessed it, <clears throat> but the little guy was dead. Now, what would it, uh, would that startle you when he looked so healthy? I thought, what? And there's a story in the Bible that jumped into my mind immediately. What story is it? Ananias and Sapphira. And I thought, I made an Ananias and Sapphira deal. But God was good to me. He didn't take my life. He took the life of my calf. But do you think that had an influence on me in life? <laughs> and I never even told my father. He came down. He saw the dead calf, and he wondered, what, Wes, what in the world happened? That calf looks so good. And um, to his dying day, I didn't tell him. It was not a pleasant experience to share that. And I only share it this morning because it, it should have an impact on all of us. Don't do that with God. Does he read our thoughts? Absolutely. And if you've made a decision, then carry that decision forward. So that, this experience helped me big time in life. And these difficulties, they're not to break us. They are to make us. And it definitely has been a major uh, a good thing in my life. Now, I'm going to skip a couple of, of um, well, I'll read this quote from a man that I found, and I thought, this really is correct. Life is no straight and easy corridor along which we travel free and unhampered, but a maze of passages through which we must seek our way. Lost and confused, now and again checked in a blind alley, but always, if we have faith, God will open a door for us. Not perhaps one that we ourselves would ever have thought of, 
but one that will ultimately prove good for us. And this is exactly what he did for me. And here's a good quote from Ellen White. Not more surely is the place prepared for us in the heavenly mansions than is the special place designated on earth where we are to work for God. God does want to bless us. And how much does he want and how willing is he to do that? We read in Deuteronomy 28, and the sister that taught the good Sabbath school class this morning uh, mentioned Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is a book that we ought to read often. Our Wellness Secrets team reads this chapter every uh, fall, and we, we're going to be doing that just in the upcoming week. Deuteronomy 28, and we read about, oh, if you will do all of these things, if you will be obedient to me, then what will he do for us? Every good thing. Don't have time to count them all here. But do you know there's more to that? If you would jump over to verse 15. But if you will not do that, then what? All of these curses will come upon you. And it's not because God is just trying to punish us. It is because God loves us. And he is trying to draw us into the path through that maze to heaven. And he will do that if we are faithful. So this morning I'll share the Wellness Secrets Miracles. In the year 2000, my, mother had, my father had already passed away and my mother passed away. So I knew I was going to get an inheritance. Now, my parents were not poor, but they really weren't wealthy either. But I knew that there would be an inheritance. I have three sisters, and I knew that they had given to one of the church entities. I believe it, was, it is written, one share. So we're going to divide the inheritance five ways. The inheritance added up to about $400,000. So I'm going to get how much? $80,000, right? That's going to be my portion. Now what am I going to do with my $80,000? God had been good to me. I had a business. I had more than one business. And things were going well. And I thought of dad, and I thought of my mother, and how they had given to God. And I said to my wife one day, you know, Pearl, the folks were so good in their giving, I want to give my share of the inheritance money to God. So now if you did that, where would you give it? That's the next big question. And I didn't want to just put it in some big entity and it's just swallowed up, and you really didn't see anything accomplished with it. And so I kept pondering it for a while. And um, I, I have a garage door business. And I was sitting in the garage door business every day, taking the calls and telling the men where to go and what to do and doing the ordering and all of the tasks every day that you do. And... Uh, there was a man that was coming into my business. And uh, he came in and he started one day, he, he was buying from me. We sell wholesale as well as retail. And he was buying wholesale. And so he was in every, uh, oh, about two times a week. And so he, he came in one day and he said, Wes, he said, you need to buy my little glass business. Glass business. Everything I ever did with glass <laughs> was a failure. <laughs> Even the little roller wheel things, I never could get them to break and on the right spot and all of that. And I said, glass business, I'm not interested. I don't know anything about it. And, but he always used these words, Wes, you need to buy my glass business. And... Uh, so anyway, he's coming in, and he's coming in twice a week, and he's telling me this every time. And it's too long a story to share the whole thing. It would be very interesting if I did. Uh, but um, I, 
one day he had just left, and I was starting to ponder, you know, if I had the right person to run that business, I could buy that glass business. He wanted 80000 for it. I could buy that glass business with my money, and then I would have some income regularly, and then I could choose where I wanted to give it. And believe me, I'm going to give every cent <laughs> of my profits to God. I gave him all of it. I said, Lord, it's all of yours. Well, as one day he had just left, and this man uh, appeared in my shop. I had, uh, he'd never been in my shop before. And after the other man left, I was sitting on some boxes in the shop, in pondering mode like this, not noticing anything around me. And this man walked up to me and he said, Wes, now, by the way, this man goes to my church there in Decatur. He says, uh, Wes, um, what are you thinking about? Oh, I said, oh, there's this guy. He comes into the shop all the time and he's trying to get me to buy his, his business. And Jim says, well, what kind of business is it? I said, it's a glass business. I said, they do shower doors and mirrors in brand new homes. They don't do any replacement glass, don't do any commercial work, shower doors and mirrors in brand new homes. And Jim said to me, well, Wes, did you know that's what I did the first 15 years of my married life? And I said, no. Are you interested in running this business? He said, I might. He says, you know, I'm a carpenter and I'm tired of climbing rafters and pouring cement and all of the hard work that goes on with carpentry work. He said, putting in a shower door and a mirror is a whole lot easier than what I'm doing. And actually, Jim's a few years older than I am. And I said, well, Jim, you think about it. If you're interested, we'll go talk to this man. And he came back and he expressed interest and I went and talked to the man and I had him lay out all of his paperwork for the last five years to see how much does this business make. And as I looked at it and I knew I have to pay Jim, uh, it wasn't going to really pay me a lot, but uh, maybe a thousand to two thousand dollars a month. Is that a good deal? Is that a good investment? Well, I don't know, but he really wanted to do it. And he and his wife and my wife and I, by the way, she's not here today because she plays the organ in our church. And our church just seems dead when that organ isn't playing. And so um, she didn't come with me today. But anyway, we got together and we prayed about this matter and we decided to buy that business. Now, I want to tell you the year that this business was going to start. It would be January 1, 2001. Keep that date in your mind because something else happened on that very same date. Now, I want to tell you also that after we bought the business and we started to go, things went downhill. The original owner of the business name was Carl. Carl was a happy-go-lucky backslapper. <laughs> he'd go around to the builders and he'd slap them on the back and, and say, hey, uh, John, let's go have coffee and a donut. And he'd take them and they'd, they'd go off and, and eat coffee and a donut and have a little chat. He was, he was a friendly guy. And Jim was quite the opposite. He's not a talker. But I will tell you one thing, Jim did perfect work. Carl was a little sloppy. When Carl was finished with the job, he'd leave his cardboard laying there on the floor. He would uh, uh, not clean anything. And Jim, when he was finished, he took his Windex and he cleaned the mirrors and he cleaned the shower doors and he picked up all of his trash. Well. The builders, at the beginning, missed their coffee and donut. And so they went and found somebody else, quite a few of them. 
and the business was going south very quickly. But, you know, the builders meet together in the morning, usually, at the coffee shop, and they talk. And after they, they, the ones that were still using us uh, started saying to the others, hey, you know, Jim does good work. He doesn't get us coffee and donuts, but he does good work, and he cleans all of his trash. And so here started coming back the business. It was a major trial for me. I thought the thing was over. It looked like it was going to totally collapse, and I had lost $80,000, but it started to turn around after three months, and guess what? I had to, uh, oh, by the way, let's read this thought. Afflictions, crosses, temptations, adversity, and our varied trials are God's workmen to refine us, sanctify us, and fit us for the heavenly garment. In truth, praise God for the afflictions that come. God wants us in heaven. How's he going to get us there without bringing some of these crosses in our pathway? Well, at the same time, I'm going to take you now to another side of the story. At the same time that we had this glass business starting, I was the personal ministries director of the Decatur Church. First time I'd ever had the job. I didn't want to just get up and read the conference paper from the pulpit. I wanted something to happen. And I had read about some Bible workers in Minnesota, who a Bible worker in Minnesota who just got the church on fire. And everybody was giving Bible studies, and the church was alive, and people were joining the church. And I got excited when I read that story. And I found out where the Bible worker came from. It was from the Black Hills. The man's name that ran the school is uh, Therese. Anybody know about that school out there? And uh, I contacted him, Louis Therese. I said, Louis, I'm personal ministries director of my church in Arkansas. We're looking for a Bible worker. How can we find a Bible worker? He said, I don't know. He said, because these people are coming here Someone is sending them, and they're, we're training them, and they go back to their own church. So it's not like uh, some, uh, somebody comes here to be trained, and then they're looking for somewhere to go. And uh, so anyway, it was, it's an involved story, and I was very disappointed that I wasn't going to be able to find someone. When one day, into our church came an elderly couple who we'd never seen before, and when we went to fellowship dinner, my wife and I sat down to meal with them. And I started telling him about my disappointment. We're not getting a Bible worker. I wanted a Bible worker. We need somebody in church who's doing this full time and that has enthusiasm, can get us fired up. And this, those people knew these people. And uh, they said, we know the perfect couple. And I said, really? I said, uh, wh who are they? Where do they live? Well, they live in Colorado. And, and um, I said, uh, well, our daughter lives in Colorado. Where are these people at? Well, close to Loveland. I said, well, our daughter lives close to Loveland. And we're going out there. So they gave me the information, and I made contact with these people. And they said, yes, we really would like to do Bible work in a small church somewhere. And uh, when they walked in, these, these were the faces that we saw. Now, do you see uh, enthusiasm? You see brightness? <laughs> you see genuineness? And, oh, I was so excited. And they said, but, you know, we'd like to go to Doug Batchelor's school. He trains people to do Bible work. And it's out there in California, and we'd like to go there and be trained and and I said, it'll take four months. I said, well, that's no problem because uh, we've never had one. So we'll happily wait on you. So they went out there and they arrived in Decatur on January 1, 2001. Now, that's just when my business got started. 
And then my mind is thinking, wow, if this business will produce enough, because our church has to come up with some money. We got to rent a house for these people, and we're going to pay them 1500 a month besides the rent and, and the utilities. And um, so we need some income. Well, things didn't look good the first three months. But anyway, let me continue with these people. They came out, and I'm taking them around to the church. I show them the church, and then I walked across the little valley to the fellowship hall. And we walked in there, and they're looking around, and I heard her, her name is Narada, by the way, if you have Hope TV, she is the health coordinator for Hope TV today. Anyway, uh, uh, they're walking around, and I heard her say to Daniel, Daniel, we could do our treatments in this room. We had a little room in there. Now, what would your brain do a little flip on uh, Bible workers? I, I never knew Bible workers did treatments. And I'm thinking, what? <laughs> I said, what do you mean, treatments? They said, well, we're not just Bible workers. We do medical missionary work also. Well, I've read a lot in the spirit of prophecy, and I'd read over those words a lot, but I had never known a medical missionary in my life. And I thought, uh, what, really? You do medical missionary work. So what is it that qualifies you to do medical work? Well, she says, Daniel is a licensed massage therapist, and he has been the, the director of the health program at Eden Valley for seven years. And I am a doctor. <laughs> I just about fell over. I mean, little Decatur, Arkansas, can get this quality of people to come and do Bible work at our church? I was excited. And uh, I spent a lot of time with them. Now, I'll share with you, this is the building that I was taking them around through. That's our fellowship hall. While they were there, they had put up a little banner on the outside of the building that said, Wellness Secrets. So they are the ones that named our health uh, program there in Decatur. And people started to come in. And I would watch them. And one day, there was this man and his wife that came in. These were not Adventist people. He came and, and said, I understand someone up here knows natural remedies. Is there anything that you could do to help me? And so he proceeded to show her, he had a bulge on his left side about half the size of a football. And he told her that he had been to the doctors in Muskogee, Oklahoma. They had put him on the operating table and they intended to take out the tumor. But they found that it had already grown into his bowel and it was, it was totally encasing a major artery. Well, my mind, I'm not medical in any way. I was not. <laughs> I grew up about as far away from that as you could get. But in my mind, I said, oh, sorry, you're too old, number one. He was 72. This is a huge tumor. Uh, the doctors in Muskogee had told him, I'm sorry. They stitched him back up. They said, you've got about two to three months to live. And uh, that's when he comes up there. And I'm saying, no, no, this, there's no hope for this man. And I hear Nera to give him hope. And I am floored. I didn't say anything. But in my mind, I'm saying, Nerida, don't lie. This is not, this is impossible. Too big a tumor, too old a man, too far gone. No way. She laid out the program. I won't have time to tell you this morning the whole program, but it changed his diet, it changed his exercise. He was to, to walk in the sunlight, he was to take, drink lots of water. He had peach orchard on his little farm. 
and he had a pile of peach pits. He was to break those open and eat a couple of the pits every day. And uh, she had a whole program. The first two weeks, it was nothing but vegetable juice. And, then, and this man was used to eating <laughs> the worst of the worst. They lived in the, in the country. These were country people. He'd go shoot it out of the woods, bring it in. They skinned it. She fixed it. They ate it. They had catfish for breakfast. They had deer meat for dinner and possum for supper. <laughs> That's the kind of folks they were. Well, this is going to be a major change. But they tell Narada, we don't have any alternatives. I'm going to die. I will do whatever you tell me to do. And they did. And besides the diet and all of the exercise and everything, they also prescribed that you're going to take what we call fever therapy treatments. Anybody heard of it before? A few of you. I thought fevers were bad. When I grew up, mother was always trying to get the fever down. In truth, fevers are good for you, up to a certain point, of course. Anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to put you in a little steam cabinet. Let's see, I have a picture here. It's the little white cabinet there. You call it a Russian steam cabinet. Has a little door on the front. You sit in it. We have steamer underneath, and it cooks you. <laughs> And we're going to get your body temperature up to 102. And uh, we want to keep it there for 20 minutes. And Wes, I want you to help uh, with, uh, with some of this treatment. I want you to keep cool towels on his head. Not really anxious to have the brain cooked. But we want to get the body temperature up. So I'm putting cool towels on his head. I'm sticking a thermometer in his mouth. And I'm recording every five minutes where his temperature's at. And I, I can share with you that it, it wasn't too often that we got him to the 102. Often it was not. It was lower than that. And in a steam cabinet, it's not the best method. We do it now with water. We have wonderful tubs that we put people in. And I can get the fever up to 102 in about 10 to 15 minutes time and the people suffer a whole lot less this poor man was in that steamer for close to an hour <laughs> to get the cabin and to get the temperature up and to hold it up after he came out of the cabinet the first time we had a shower there in the building and we had him go in the shower and shower off because you're all covered with sweat and uh, we wrapped him in a white sheet and we laid him on a cot for uh, an hour to recuperate. It's a treatment that you need to recuperate afterward. And after the one hour, I went in to raise him. And I looked and that sheet was as brown as dirt. And I thought, man, that's amazing. I mean, he's already had a shower. But all this pollution that he'd been putting into his body is coming out of the pores. And day by day, it got less as time went. We gave him one treatment a day, five days a week, three weeks in a row. I'm not putting out a recipe, right, by the way, here. You need to know what you're doing. This isn't something for amateurs to do. But, and I've learned that somewhat the hard way. But uh, three weeks in a row, skip two weeks, give them a break, go through the whole thing again. We went to, through two of the three-week treatments with him. And then they came to Narada and they said, Narada, uh, you know, you guys are busy. Do you know when those two uh, Bible workers were there? <laughs> we had as many as 55 Bible studies going at one time. Church members were doing it, they were doing it, and we were all busy. And these people said, you're busy. We could do this ourselves if you'd let us take that tub home, uh, the, the steam cabinet. And she decided to do that. And they took it home, and we didn't see them for now about three to four months. 
after six months from when we started the program, they came back. And when they came back, let's see if I have their picture. Yeah, that, that picture that I showed you is the picture when they came back. And he was so happy to show Narada that this side looked like this side. And uh, Narada said, uh, now Richard, I want you to go back to those doctors in Muskogee. I want the same scans that they ran on you the first time, and please bring me copies because I'm a doctor and I want to see them. And he did. They really weren't happy to see him. They had predicted his death long before, and here he is without even a sign of a tumor. They did the scan, and they pronounced him cancer-free. And uh, they brought the, he brought the, uh, the scans back. Narada read them. She says, Richard, it looks to me that you don't have any sign of cancer in your body at this time. And uh, I'll let you know that he got to walking five miles a day. He was drinking lots of water and doing all the things that he had been asked to do. And uh, he came back a year ago and walked into our center. Now this happened in 2001. So how many years are we talking about? 13 years later, he walked into our center. He is still cancer free. He is still on the good uh, food, the uh, veg veg vegetable diet. He is still um, drinking the water and the exercise and the sunlight and all of that. Well, now, do you think that changed something up here for me? That had a major impact on me. That if these medical doctors are condemning this man to his grave, and this little lady with very, very simple treatments gives him his life back, of course, with the power of God, it's may, it had an impact on me, and I, I decided I want to do something. Daniel and Erida were only there for a year, and uh, they wanted us to continue the program. They trained us every Sunday, three hours worth for the whole year. We learned uh, all kinds of things, but you still don't feel like you're prepared to run the show. And, but we, they said, well, don't do cancer patients, but you can do pneumonia, you can do diabetes, you can do weight control, you can do, there were a lot of things that they named, simple things that people could come in and we could help them with. And we were going to build two rooms on the end of that building. That wouldn't cost too much. $10,000, we thought we could build it and put them on the end. And somebody said, well, you know what? You need to think about this because that is conference property. You better talk to the conference. So we did. And they were nice. They were kind. They thought it through. They got a hold of their attorney and so forth. And the attorney said, you know, uh, this we are in a sue-happy generation. And if you would hurt somebody, and it is possible to hurt someone, uh, they could sue the church. And they like big fish, they could sue the whole conference over this deal. And we prefer that you get your own facility. Now that threw a whole new, new curve. And time went by quite a bit, a year and a half. We were still meeting, we were talking about it. One day, the treasurer of our little group came to me in church. And she said, Wes, I gotta tell you what happened. This week, and she was, she's full of enthusiasm, and she's got urgency about her. And, uh, yeah, I said, Wanda, what, what's the deal? What happened? Well, she said, Wes, I came up to do the books here at the church and write checks. And when I drove out the church driving uh, driveway, a bright light lit up on the property across the street. And it's shown on the for sale sign. Do you know about the property across the street? I said, yes, I sure do. This was it. 
I said, I look the other way when I come to church. I don't look over there. It's a very ugly piece of property. Got a big old ravine in the back, and nothing had been tended to for a year. Nobody had mowed or anything over there. I said, Wanda, that is not what I have in mind. I've got in mind some beautiful little place out in the woods with a little stream, and it's quiet, and it's not on the main highway. Wanda says, Wes, you got to go see that real estate man. This is truth. It happened to me when I drove out the driveway. I said, okay. So I went to some of the men in the church. I said, we've walked the property three acres. I said, what do you think that they want? For three acres, it had two buildings on them. That one and a little two-bedroom bungalow house. What do they want for that? And uh, oh, the guys said, you know, Wes, it's on the highway. It's got three acres, and the buildings are not bulldoze material. They could be useful. They need some work. They'll want 80000 And in fact, I, I found out that it had been appraised for 80000 well, I'd, I cut the story short and tell you that I went to the real estate man and we bought this property for $45,000. And I thought, my, I can't lose $45,000 for that much for these buildings. I'll show you the house in a little bit. There's only one problem. I'm closing in on retirement time. And Pearl and I had been to the, to the sunroom place in Springdale. And we had price put in a sunroom on the back of our house. And we, we'd also thinking about doing this, you know. And what? I'm going to take the money we've been saving up for retirement and I'm going to buy this property? This is a whole new direction in life. Now, that's a major T in my maze when I came to. What am I going to do? But I could not forget Richard. I could not get him out of my mind. I thought that was so remarkable that this man got his life back. And I told Pearl, I said, Pearl, I would like to give our retirement money and buy this property and let's get started to fix it and so forth. And she said, if that's what you want to do, then let's do it. So that's how it got started. Now, there's the back side. Looks a little better from the back, especially after I brush hogged and mowed down the brush that was all around there. And um, anyway, while we're doing some work on the thing, you probably could see there in that picture, in comparison with the road, you can see that the building is two feet down from the highway. And if you look, you notice the basement doors are the height of the basement and they had been cut off. Well, it was a plumber's shop, and a plumber was five foot four, but Wes is six foot four, and it isn't gonna work. And I'm thinking, really, it's not good because it's down from the highway. Hey, if I could jack it up two feet, I would have a full height basement, and then we could fill all in fill on the front and make a nice driveway and so forth. So I'm in the process of seeing how much would it cost to jack this building up. And I got some house mover to come. And he looked at it. And he says, uh, $8,000. I'll jack it up. You put your little knee walls in. I'll let it down, and you can go from there. And I thought, oh, my. I don't want to spend 8000 just doing that. Well, I was up front in the Decatur Church every week telling of the progress across the road. And while I was up front that one week, I looked in the audience back here, and I saw this man that's sitting way down at the end in the corner. I saw him in the audience, and I thought, surely not. That's so-and-so. I taught his children. I used to be a school teacher at Oak Park in Iowa. Uh, many years ago now, <laughs> I had taught his children at Oak Park 25 years earlier. And I thought, he's in church? 
I heard he didn't even go to church anymore. Well, anyway, when church was over and I'm out there in the foyer and I'm always there greeting and talking to people new in the church and so forth, and he's anxious to see me. He said, Wes, I heard about your project. And do you know what? You know I'm a carpenter. I said, yeah. Well, he said, I've retired. And I just bought a place four miles up the road from you. How can I help you? I want to come help you. I said, uh, Dick, have you ever jacked a building up? He said, sure I have. I'll meet you over there in the morning. The next Sunday morning, we started on this project of jacking this building up. And he was such a good mind to know uh, that all the materials that we bought were used in the project of, of uh, fixing this place. Nothing was wasted, and he charged me absolutely zero. Another one of the amazing miracles there. Uh, we had women from the church helping, running jacks. One lady had her little baby in this sling, and she would be pumping the jack as we would all do it together. I had the idea that you jack a building up like this. He had a much better idea. Well, you just go up here. You put a two-by-four in. You let it down. You take this side up. You put two two-by-fours in, let it down. You go back and forth like this. It's solid all the way up. No pops, no bangs, no disaster. <laughs> and uh, everything went wonderful. So here we are. It was a great experience with the church people helping, uh, young and old. Um, I, I want to tell you about these two Mexican men. Well, there was a carpenter and myself doing all the work up to that point, And it was going too slow. And I needed more help. And I was working on the side of the building. And these two guys drove up in their pickup. And they rolled the window down. They couldn't speak English very good. But anyway, I got the message that they understood that I needed help. And I said, yeah, I need help. But what can you do? Well, what do you need done? We can do carpenter work. We can lay blocks. We can do stucco. We can build cabinets. We can do drywall. We can lay carpet. We can paint. What do you need? I see that you need it all. But what do you charge? They said, we'll do it for $11 an hour apiece. I said, you're hired. We'll give you a try. And by, by the way, how did you know that I needed help? They said, well, we were driving down the street, and a voice spoke in our pickup and said, turn around, that man over there needs help. And I said, man. The Lord was in this project from the very beginning. I was not cheating with any of the money anymore. And everything was being done according to the counsel that God gave us. We were reading and studying the counsel. We gave Bible studies to both of these men. They belonged to the Jehovah Witness Church. They were coming to our church until finally something happened and they both, both families had to move away and because of the communication thing, I didn't keep up contact with them, but hopefully they're in our Adventist church somewhere today. The Lord is, was in this. And then I want to share with you the miracle income. I told you how the, the glass business was in the nosedive, but after three months, when they found out the good work that was being done by this man, it started to turn around. And I had to put on another man and another man and another man just at the time when all of this building was going on. And we had other people hired as well. I had a lady come to help us with the health work. In six years' time, that little glass business produced my share, my share of the profits. God's share was $400,000. How, how much was the overall inheritance? <laughs> $400,000. The Lord gave it all back. 
to build this project. And it's been an amazing thing because my banker came by one day and he said, Wes, I want to just show you some of the pictures. Uh, that money was able to take this house and make it look like that. It was able to take that house, which was on the property, the one where we had the main building, and make it look like that. That's now a guest home for us. It was able to put this piece uh, on our property, an amazing uh, thing. There's too much to tell. It took the uh, ugly landscape that I thought. I thought it would look terrible. It took it and transformed it and was able, we've now got the grounds all under control and has turned this thing. I wish I could tell you more about the addition we put onto that building. And then we had one more. I got to tell you this one more. Now, I was told in the back that your preacher does go long sometimes, so I'm going to quit now, though. I'm just going to bring you to one more uh, story that I've got to share this morning. Uh, and it's, uh, it was a major, major test. Any of you that are in the building trade know that in the year 2007, our economy went down. And what happened to the building of new homes? They're not doing that anymore. And so what happens to a little glass business that puts shower doors and mirrors in new homes? Well, it's collapsing. This was the little team that we had at that time. My wife is in front of me and our other three. Anyway, here's some figures. These are gross amounts that were coming into the glass business month by month. And you can see we had some pretty good months. But do you see what's happening at the end of that year? That's 2007. And then what's it look like in 2008? January, and I still have two workers. I had $7,000 in the bank and left, and I had bills to pay. I had an insurance bill of $2,000. I had uh, the women at the center to pay. I had the boys to pay. And one day, one boy called me, and he said, Wes, transmission's out of my truck. These are Ford F-250, four by four trucks. Transmissions out of my truck. Oh, wonderful. Isn't that wonderful? The next day, the other boy called and said, Wes, the engine's out of my truck. Now, this is a major test. We've got this thing going. It's rolling. Everything's been going wonderfully. And now it's over. And I said to my wife, well, how far do we go with this thing? She says, you go until you've spent the last penny. You've committed to uh, not going into debt. We, we said that at the very beginning. We'll never go into debt, but we will go until we spend the last penny. And so I came in to worship with, with where the women were seated for worship that morning, and I, I said, uh, ladies, I'm sorry, but our uh, trip is over here. We're just at the beginning of this recession. There is no way February is always the lowest month in the construction business. <laughs> you see what January is. I'm about out of money. Once I pay these bills, I'll, it's all gone. There's not even enough to pay the bills. But the leader said, Wes, we haven't prayed about this. And I'm thinking I'm a realist. I'm thinking I don't think even God can take do anything about this. We're in the very beginning of this recession. But I said, Kay, you're right. We haven't prayed about it. And so we started to pray earnestly. And the very next day, now we're starting February, that day, my manager called me and said, Wes, my phone is ringing off the hook today. I said, that's great. That's wonderful. Why? Where can it be? Where are the houses? Second day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, all day, all week long, Sabbath, he walks into church and showed me the phone full of numbers to call. All next week, next week, and next week. Can I show you what we did for February? That's my next slide. Oh, there's a, a thought from Ellen White. Man's extremity 
is God's opportunity. When did he help the Israelites? When they are up against the mountain and the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army at a gallop. That's when he helped them. And it's all through. You'll see the same thing with the Hebrew four, the three Hebrews that were standing there before the fiery furnace. Right when they threw them in, things changed. God changed it for us. February, which is always the smallest month of the year, we brought in $35,000. I put a new motor in, a new transmission in. I paid the women to all the bills, and I had 20000 in the bank at the end of February. And there's the rest of the year. And it's kept going. It's uh, actually picked up from those numbers, and it's done very well this year. Now here we are to 2015. The recession has been in the past. I expect it again. We're going to have more trials. But I know one thing. My faith is through the roof as to what God can do if we will give ourselves fully to him. And I think I want to close on that note. Um, there's, there's so much more that I could share. I'd love to share with you all of the people that we have been a blessing to, the kinds of people who have come to a knowledge of the truth through the medical missionary work. It is supposed to be the entering wedge, and it is. We have a man that's coming this next week. We're having a spiritual health week, and the topic is on prayer. Our facility is full. We can't take any more people to come. But a man from Little Rock, he is a Church of Christ man. He's been up for three sessions already, and he is really interested. He's reading the Spirit of Prophecy books. He has a business on the bypass of Little Rock with 50 service trucks. He is, uh, you would never reach, I don't know if you've had any experience with Church of Christ, very difficult people to work with. Medical missionary work opens a door that you would not be able to open other ways. I wish I could share more, and I don't have the time. It's time for us to close. I just want to leave these thoughts with you. God still is on the throne, and he works, and he has the same power he had when he did all the miracles in the Bible. And he will do them for us today if we follow the counsel in Deuteronomy 28. Let's sing in closing our song um, that's in your bulletin. It's 559. Someone please come lead this. I'm not good at uh, leading songs. Um, now thank we all our God. Number 559. Please stand for the closing hymn.
Dear Father, again, I want to give you thanks. You are the one who has all of the power to give blessings and to provide where we could never do it on our own. And I thank you for leading us through the maze, Lord. You're anxious to lead all of us home. And so that someday we will be with you in your kingdom. And I just pray that you will continue with your Holy Spirit and angels to work with each one this morning and continue to give us a blessed Sabbath day. I pray this in Jesus.